What's the word, y'all? We got to talk about these Clippers, man. They are 0-4 in the Russell Westbrook era. I'm going to say that again. They are all in four in the Russell Westbrook era. This is such weird times because usually when players get bought out, they go to a different team, and now they're the sixth, seventh, eighth man on a good team. We have Russell Westbrook, Patrick Beverly, Kevin Love, and at least until last night, Justin Holiday all getting bought out by previous teams, going to their new team like, oh, I'm immediately in the starter lineup. Well, you could argue that all four of those cases, it ain't going great. I mean, the Bulls are three and one. But they also almost blew a 24-point lead to the Detroit Pistons, who don't have Cade Cunningham, who were missing three other starters. Um, but like Kevin Love and the Miami Heat look bad. Justin Holiday and the Mavericks look bad. But guess what? Jason Kidd let let Josh Green get 30 minutes again, and they and they won. Look at look at that. And Russell Westbrook and company are on four, so it has not been great for the big buyout market candidates uh, yet, at least. I'm gonna say it though. Russell Westbrook is not the sole reason why the Clippers are 0 and four in this time frame. Yeah, it has not looked pretty. But it's a lot deeper than that. Twitter, Twitter was, a, was a war zone yesterday between the Russell Westbrook stands and the Russell Westbrook's haters. It, it, was, it, it was a lot to be said. And the, the haters are eating right now. I will admit, the haters are eating, eating right now. I am in the middle. I don't have a strict opinion about Russ one way or another. I'm just a guy that's trying to be level-headed when I make these, these conversations and make these type of videos. Yesterday, objectively, terrible. Draymond Green's sole purpose, he said in his post-game interview, his sole purpose last night was to make Russell Westbrook overthink the game that he loves the most, in the game of basketball, by allowing him to get as much space as possible. And now Russell Westbrook's thinking, well, I know I can hit this shot, but is it a good shot for me to take? You know what? I'll fire off a couple. Brick, brick. And now for the rest of the game, he's trying to figure out how do I impact this team when I'm not even being guarded. Now the rest of my teammates, all four of my teammates around the perimeter are doing whatever they're doing. They're playing four on five because Draymond Green is playing safety. And that third quarter comes around, the offense is absolutely dreadful. And defensively, I don't know when the Clippers are going to decide to finally clip up. They got Kawhi Leonard, who, who's known as one of the best perimeter defenders, not just in today's era, but just in general, known as one of the greatest perimeter defenders in the game of basketball, in, in the history of it. Paul George is a top three DPOY type candidate, and they still don't defend. And they got people around them that have reputations of being positive defenders. They do not defend. The Golden State Warriors, Jordan Poole, Klay Thompson hits a big time shots. Draymond Green was driving past Kawhi Leonard. I'm like, yo, I know Kawhi's missed some time and he's still trying to ramp up, but that's Draymond Green. They don't defend. You allow a third quarter for Clay to get as many open shots, for Jordan Poole to get as open, many open shots. You can't really believe that you're going to keep a lead like that because the Warriors, even without Steph Curry, are one of the best three-point shooting teams in basketball. Quick flowers to the Golden State Warriors. Um, Seth, Stephen Curry is coming back very soon, and they've done an amazing job staying afloat because uh, I was a little bit skeptical. I was a little bit afraid for them and their hopes to stay out of the plan. They've been damn good. Jordan Poole deserves a lot of love. Uh, uh, Clay Thompson deserves a lot of love, and Draymond Green deserves a lot of love, and Kevon Looney, everybody really, Kevon Looney getting a lot of boards, at least yesterday, Jonathan Kaminga hits a big time shot to make, it's a big time play, so I want to give them a lot of love, but this is not a video about them, but shout out to them. Clippers fans, you want to close your ears on this specific part, just on this specific part, close your ears and come back in, in 16 seconds. Before the trade deadline, the 14 games leading up to the trade deadline, the Clippers were 10-4, and, and, and now they can't buy a win. Now they can't buy you in. What is the reason that things have shifted so dramatically? When we were having a conversation on this channel where, I, where we were trying to debate whether or not adding Russell Westbrook was a good idea or a bad idea for the Clippers, one of the things that I mentioned is the fact that they had to incorporate Eric Gordon, Bones Highland, who don't really play unless it's against the, the Denver Nuggets, and then Mason Plumlee. Oh, and now Russell Westbrook. They have to incorporate four new players to a team with, let's say, 19 games left to play. Trade deadline hits, and now Tyron Lue is trying to figure out this is the lineup we want to play with in this minutes. This is that, this and that, and this and that, and he's trying his best to do so, but it's extremely hard for him, and he ain't, he ain't like the perfect saint right now either, but it's extremely hard for him to figure out exactly what lineup should be ran because the sample size of every single lineup is extremely, extremely small. This is from Reddit. Jimmy V says the Clippers with Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, and Russell Westbrook on court have an offensive rating of 101 and a defensive rating of 115. Uh, if you're doing the math, that is a net rating of 14, negative 14. On the season, PG and Kawhi have a plus about 8. That was pre-All-Star. And then after All-Star, it is a minus 12. You hear that? Pre-All-Star was a plus 8. And, and my uh, after All-Star, it is a minus 12. 
Again, bigger sample size from the previous and then small sample size again four four games or so. But still, whoa. Again, I don't want you to believe that it's just the Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, or Russell Westbrook thing because I'm looking at all the lineup data and they don't have lineups that are positive right now. <laughs> I mean, uh, this lineup, this this three man unit played one minute together. They were they were whoa, they were good. But like as far as people that have played real minutes, they don't have a lineup that's considered good post post break. And we're just talking three man rotation. You know what was a damn good lineup pre? Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, and Terrence Mann. We mentioned the streak and the 14 games leading up to the All-Star break or the trade deadline when they were 10-4. Those are games that Terrence Mann had been inserted into the starting lineup, and he had played great basketball. Obviously, he's not a traditional point guard, and that was one of the things that they were thinking. We need somebody that can get us into our sets that is known as a plus passer. So you know what? We're going we gonna to throw Terrence Mann back to the bench because we believe that Russell Westbrook, can, Russell Westbrook can be that. And the 21 games that Terrence Mann had started, he was averaging 11 points per game on good shooting splits we're talking 51 percent from the field 45 percent from three on, on three and a half attempts and he was playing 28 29 minutes per and since the russell westbrook experiment has started his minutes have dropped off dramatically so he was playing his best basketball of his young career and then now he's not completely out of rotation he's still getting 20 minutes here 23 minutes here but now his role has just shifted. The game before Russell Westbrook became a part of the team, the game before the trade that, oh, I'm sorry, the all-star break is a win against the Suns where Terrence Mann had 26 on 10 of 12. And now you're telling him, oh, you next game, Russell Westbrook will come in. This is a double overtime game, mind you. You're going to play 15 minutes. So the thing that they had been ramping up towards going into the trade deadline the, the, the continuity aspect of it was automatically shattered. And again, we're talking about continuity on the team. That star player might not play here and star player might not play there. And boom, now we got a hot pods, this lineup together. And throughout the course of the, the Clippers era with Tyron Lue, he's done a decent job in that. At least until this year. At 33 and 32, the Clippers have their worst regular season record through 65 games since 2010-2011. The Clippers have been this pinnacle of regular season goodness, at least until now, where they're just one game over 500. And Paul George um, went on to Tommy Alter in JJ's podcast, Old Man in the Three, and he made it seem like the low management thing wasn't a PG and Kawhi thing. It was more about the organization, which I I thought would, was really interesting. Where he talked about how they would wear these chips and these chips to let them know, hey, he played a little bit too hard here. He needed a little bit of a rest. And he was saying that it knocks off kind of this rhythm that he had grown accustomed to. He, he said that the new changes to the lineups and the schedules messed up this little rhythm where he he's used to playing three games and four nights. And now because the NBA schedule is so different, and so elongated that now he thinks that the injuries are an all-time high because of that. And I just thought it was interesting because I have always looked at it as like, okay, Kawhi Leonard had been low management, low managing before he got to the Clippers, so it's not necessarily a full Clippers thing. But PG is saying that, hey, it's it's kind of them and not us. We want to hoop. Now, I didn't expect him to go into JJ's show and say, hell yeah, we the one that's saying we don't want to play tonight. But I didn't also expect him to say, it was because of the chips. It's because of the chips. It's because of our training staff and things like that. And because of all of these things, I, I've mentioned here on this channel, the Clippers have been a team that I have kind of steered away from talking about because it's impossible to really know what their identity is. They have so many players around there that I look to be like really great role players, hard-nosed defenders, and I thought that was what their identity was going to be, especially when you consider they're, they're led by Kawhi Leonard and they're, they're secondarily led by Paul George, who are two of the best perimeter defenders in basketball. I thought for sure that their, identi their identity was going to be that, and it has been everything but that. Now, the numbers post um, bringing in Russell Westbrook are all skewed because they had the second highest scoring game in the history of basketball in the game that they they ended up losing. So I can't even look at the, the data completely from that and say that this is the truth be, be, because they played a double overtime game where 400 points were scored. But the offense has become anemic. And I guess it has been that case for a good ch chunk of the season. Um, and it's not ideal. It's just not ideal. I mean, their idea is like, hey, we're going to get there. Kawhi Leonard has his reputation of being a, a cyborg once playoff time comes around. And we believe we can hang with any other team in the entire league in a seven-game series as long as we have Kawhi and as long as we have Paul George. And I'm not saying they're wrong to have that mindset, but I believe that the continuity thing is more important than a lot of people believe. What is it, 17 games left in the season? How do they figure things out? How long 
will we see Russell Westbrook start with a go back to experimenting like the Lakers did with having him come off the bench? Or like I mentioned in the video um, when we were talking about Russell Westbrook signing there, do they feel some type of obligation to him? Because because Paul George has been has been really adamant before Russell Westbrook got picked up about adding Russell Westbrook. Like that was something he talked about in post game interviews. He talked about the All Star Game press conference. He was saying that he would love to have Russell Westbrook in the locker room. He'd love to have Russell Westbrook on the team. And I'm sure that Tyron Lue and company are trying to figure out, hey, may, 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 maybe this ain't this ain't what we want as far as starter. We were looking a lot better with Terrence Mann in that that position. Zubats has also been injured for a good portion of this as well. So now they're missing their starting center. Yesterday they were missing the Morris brother so like again it's a lot to try to digest and try to dissect and it's it's impossible it's almost impossible to figure out exactly what to say and expect but i know one thing they don't want to do they don't want to be in that plan nope they desperately don't want to be nobody wants to be in the plan but the clippers definitely do not want to be in that plan especially against some of the other teams that are in the conversation with them and and the russell westbrook minutes are so interesting because we mentioned in that previous video that the clippers are one of the best jump shooting teams in all of basketball but now if teams are playing Russell Westbrook the way that the Warriors just played him, a lot of that jump shooting opportunity is completely gone because there's an extra defender to guard those things. I don't know if there's anything else to say. Uh, knowing my luck with these videos, uh, they're going to go in and beat the, the Kings by 16 tonight. And then we're going to be all cool again. Uh, but this is a reactionary NBA. So that's what we did.